everybody, Dr. Tom Moorcroft here. Really appreciate you joining me today. Uh, I wanted to talk about Lyme disease and transmission of Lyme after a tick bite. So, the you know, there's this misnomer out there that, or misunderstanding that, you know, the deer tick that transmits Lyme has to be attached to you for 36 to 48 hours in order to transmit Lyme. So in animal models, this has actually been looked at, and they found that transmission can happen in less than 16 hours. And the authors of that paper actually said that the minimum attachment time for transmission has never been established, which is another way of saying we, we really don't know. Now, there are at least three cases in the medical literature that show that Lyme can be transmitted in less than 24 hours. Uh, I have a case in my practice that where we found uh, DNA evidence, definitive proof based on the history and the blood test that this person actually did have transmission of Lyme disease from the bite of an infected deer tick in less than 24 hours. This, uh, what, this case was offered up for publication, but we were told that um, really good science, but it's not something people need to know about. So to be honest with you, that's a bit frustrating to me because these are the things people need to know about. And if we're going to tell everybody that Lyme can be transmitted only after it's been on, you know, the, the bite's been a day and a half old, well, then that better be the, the truth and not some sort of like, you know, um, filtered uh, medical literature approach to things. And it's important to understand. So we know that it can happen in less than 24 hours. There's even cases of anaplasmosis that can be transmitted in as little as eight hours. And anaplasmosis is another tick-borne infection that can come from that same deer tick that transmits Lyme. So it is important to understand that transmission can probably happen at any point. Now, if we look at sort of the curve, so adult ticks will feed for uh, anywhere upwards of five days. And so, you know, in the first day, there's probably less than a 5% transmission rate, but it's not zero. And this is based on sort of really old science. And so that needs to be updated and studied more closely. The other thing is the nymphal tick, which, you know, statistically get uh, nymphs are responsible for 95% of the Lyme disease out there. These things only feed for four days. So if you take that five day period, you squish it down, into a four-day window, your risk of transmission in that first day or two is increased a bit. Now, certainly, I don't think I've ever heard anyone argue that on day three, four, and five, the risk is not much greater than in the first day, but the risk is not zero in the beginning. And there has been some other research where, you know, typically what we find is that the Lyme spirochete is living in the gut of the tick and then it has to swim into you while the tick is feeding. But we have found some evidence that the, uh, there are ticks that actually will have the Lyme spirochete in this, their salivary glands. And so when the tick bites you, it puts its mouth parts in. And then so you can't feel it, it injects an, anti, uh, an anesthetic. And often people, there are a handful of people out there who actually get itchy when they get bit by a tick. And that's because of that anesthetic and, and they have a reaction to it, which makes them itchy, which for them is actually a good thing because now they're gonna feel it a lot sooner than say someone else might. The other thing the tick injects is an in anticoagulant and that's so the blood flows so they can keep getting their blood meal. But these are coming out of the salivary gland. So if there are spirochetes in your salivary gland, it's theoretically possible that near instantaneous transmission could occur. Now, this has not been confirmed, but cert that it, it, it does happen in, in, in tick to human transmission, but the possibility is out there. So when you're in an area where Lyme disease is, is, is um, rampant, you see a lot of it, the ticks, many of the ticks are infected, Lyme any tick bite is a high risk tick bite and it's just something to keep in mind. So then the question is, what do I do now? So after a tick bite, um, one is we wanna remove the tick properly and so removing the tick properly involves taking a, a pair of very sharp tweezers with the needle tip and grabbing as close to the skin as possible, right at the mouth parts, lifting up and just waiting. They have barbed mouth parts and what we wanna do is let them release that. There's all kinds of other methods of doing this, twisting, pooling, you know, um, putting salves on them, essential oils and stuff. We really, there's no good evidence that those things work and they probably irritate the, the tick more than they don't. And so if we irritate the tick and it tries to jet propulsion itself out of you to kind of get those mouth parts out quickly, it's gonna do that by regurgitation, which then just increases your risk of getting Lyme transmitted to you. So use those needle point tweezers 
or if you have one of the um, other things that like the V in them, just get under those mouth parts, lift straight up. It might take 10 seconds, it might take 60 seconds, it could even take a couple minutes. Just wait and the, the mouth parts will release. Once we've removed the tick and we've cleaned the area, well, what do we do? There are some studies in prophylaxis, uh, and that was the single dose doxycycline, 200 milligrams given once. And this study was really looking at rash. And so they were saying, if you know I gave you a single dose of doxycycline, could I prevent the rash? And then they assumed that prevention of rash meant prevention of Lyme disease. The problem is rash is often missing in Lyme disease. According to the CDC, about a third of people with Lyme never show the rash. The medical literature shows somewhere in the 40 to 60% range, so call it 50% don't show a rash. And, and these are all confirmed cases by the strictest re, you know, epidemiologic research criteria. In clinical practice, we see lots of people with evidence of Lyme who don't remember a rash, and so that percentage is actually probably lower than 50%. But even at 50%, you know, that's that basically that study was saying, can I prevent a rash in 50% of people? So the problem with this is people in the study got Lyme. Um, there are a lot of flaws in it. And then the other part is if we give you a single dose of an antibiotic, we may prevent you from getting the rash, and we may, and, but you still have Lyme, and we may prevent you from developing antibodies in your blood. And if we de prevent the antibody development and the rash development, two of our major diagnostic tools, rash and blood tests being positive, are now not helpful. So you can have symptoms, we test you, we're like, oh, it's not Lyme, it might be something else. So I, I strongly recommend against doing this single dose of a doxycycline because it's just not shown to work. Now, the problem I've also seen is that a lot of people, particularly pediatricians, have been going out there and going, oh, well, if you could use one dose of doxy, you can use a single dose of amoxicillin or ceftin or these other antibiotics that are acceptable in really young kids, and that's not been studied. And so we have no idea whether that's going to work or not work. And then, so there are other approaches to prophylaxis, and um, the studies are scant, and, but when you look at the best ones out there, there's a mouse study that shows if you use a long-acting doxycycline, which would be equivalent to a 20-day dose of a doxycycline in people, then we have 100% prevention of Lyme in artificially infected mice. So while they're not humans, it's a good model. And so a lot of us out there are saying, if you do get bit by a tick, you really should get at least a 20 day course of an antibiotic to help prevent it. And in this case, really all we can say is doxycycline works because we don't know the answer for the other antibiotics. And the few that have been tested have, have, have varying results. So typically people are gonna suggest that you do something like a, a three week course. We, um, and, and reassess. Um, many practitioners I know will do four to six weeks right off the bat. I tend, I tend to, you know, all other things being equal, look at doing a three-week course, reassessing the patient right before that ends and determining, you know, if there's anything else that needs to be done. But that's kind of an important piece is to understand that, you know, the, the literature that's out there really doesn't show us that a single dose is going to work. The best we have is a mouse study that shows that a 20-day uh, doxycycline course will work in them. It's really not been done in people. I hope to see it done soon, but until then, we really need to treat the person in front of us and utilizing uh, the best data we have, you know, is we, we, we should be looking at something like a 21-day course. Again, everything is super individual. All these research studies out there and all these videos people make and all the g written guidelines are just that. They're guidelines. So, Hopefully some of this information will be helpful to you, helpful to your doctor. I'll drop a couple of those papers in the links below. That way you can see what I'm talking about and dive into a little bit deeper for yourself. If you have any questions or topics you want to see me talk about in the future, please drop them in the comments below. Hope you guys have a great day. Thanks so much for joining me. Be well.